I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hi, I'm Sarthak, and I welcome you to one more episode of All Things Policy. In this episode, we are going to discuss about the Union Budget 2022-23, basically the annual financial statement that the Finance Minister presented in the Parliament on February 1st. This statement has an account of the revenue, the expenditure of the government for the previous year. It also has the estimates, the projections of the same for the upcoming fiscal. The numbers in the statement give an idea about a host of things. In this episode, we will try to shed some light on these numbers. For this episode, I am joined by my colleagues Pranay, Apoorv, and Suman. Hi, Pranay. Hi, Apoorv. Hi, Suman. Hi. Hey, Sarthak. Thanks for having us. Hi, Sarthak. Another budget discussion. Are you going to discuss? Yeah. So we, I, not what I am going to discuss. What we are going to discuss. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get started on this. So Suman, you have been analyzing the union budget from the aspect of social. spending from the aspect of health and nutrition right so what are some of the things that you found interesting yeah just to begin for our listeners to give a heads up on social sector spending most of us when we are discussing the budget we get into this discussion about tax rates and what is our income tax in going to be etc if we paid as much attention to how our money is being spent rather than how much money of ours is going we probably have better accountability systems So yeah, this is an attempt to see how our money is being spent, right? So the first thing about social sector spending is it is important because that is the way the government makes a difference in uh, everybody's lives. In the sense that uh, they are we are investing in public goods, uh, in goods that have positive externalities, or any of such such sort of things. So with that kind of a prelude to the whole thing. Yeah, talking about social sector spending itself, we mostly focus on health and education. Okay, there are only ten other countries, probably ten other countries in the world that spend less than ours in other areas of health, right? And the twenty seventeen National Health Commission uh, had said that uh, by twenty twenty five, we will have a spend of about two point five percent of the GDP on health. So this is a good time to. Actually, evaluate where we are on that. When you look at the numbers as such, it's not looking too pretty. Yeah, compared to last year, we are actually spending just about point two percent higher. Because when you compare the budgeted estimates from last year to this year, it might look like it's a it's a big jump from seventy three thousand crores to about eighty six thousand. But actually, when you look at the spends of last year. We spent eighty two thousand crores, and now it's about eighty six thousand crores. So it's just about point two percent higher. Coming at the back of a pandemic, I think this is worrisome for all of us. Having said that, two big announcements in the budget were a little, I mean, were noteworthy. The first one is uh, the digital health platform, or the digital health card, or bringing everybody onto the digital platform, etc. And uh, the second one was the push towards bringing systems to to deal with challenges of mental health uh, through the National Tele Mental Health Program. These two seem interesting. I couldn't find too many uh, details on how it is going to be implemented, but I guess in the we will know in the next few days. Or so. Yeah. So, Suman, before you jump to the next bits, mm-hmm. just I wanted to uh, point out one thing that. Whatever increase you mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. This is just a very nominal increase, and in fact, if you take inflation into consideration, maybe the allocation as compared to last year, right, as compared to the revised estimates for last year, might have even been less oh, this year. Yeah. So yeah, the next part, I, I mean, I was looking at is the nutrition programs. I mean, those things that nutrition program is important because it is foundation for a lot of public health systems here, right? So and also if you look at Data: Sixty-eight percent of all deaths below age five are attributed to malnutrition, and 
the NHFS 5 report has just come out and that also does not present a very pretty picture. We are not doing too great in terms of nutrition, stunting, growth and any of those parameters. So it became all the more important to see how much is being spent or how much is being budgeted at least for these kind of schemes. Okay, so again, it's not, it doesn't look very uh, promising. It's just about 1%. So the entire nutrition scheme architecture has been revised in the last few years. Earlier, we had the ICDS and the portion of PN. Both of them have been consolidated and now it's called the Saksham Angarwadi and the portion 2. Portion stands for Prime Minister's Overarching Scheme for Health and Nutrition. If you like a uh, Good acronym, SARS. Yep. So, yeah, you see a very small increase in budgets. Again, now if you take into consideration uh, the inflation sector, the inflation factor, I don't think this is going to make a big dent in terms of how much we will spend on nutrition for this year. And the midday meal is actually, midday meal scheme is actually seeing a drop in budget allocation. Considering that student kids will be back in school and that is an important factor for kids to be back in school. I don't know how this can be justified as such. So, yeah. Suman, here again, I uh, wanted to add one thing. Uh, if you look at mm-hmm. the food subsidy, yeah, yeah. right? the food subsidy has uh, decreased this year. Decreased. It's decreased by almost 28% as compared to the revised estimates of previous year. And also it has reduced uh, as compared to the budgetary estimates. So, if you compare it with the revised estimates of last year, it is like 28% reduction. So, again, that might be a cause of concern as well. Yeah. So, uh, some other relate because health is... Uh, very broad topic. We can also look at allied fields such as uh, sanitation or education to very other, I mean, water supply and all of those things. So if you look at yeah, education as such, Samagra Shiksha itself is 20% higher than the estimates of the previous year. But compared to 2019-20, it seems only like a 3% increase. So the question really is, how will we uh, manage all of this in this the other two allied things are Jal Jeevan Mission and the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan. We see a significant increase in the Jal Jeevan Mission out, outlay from 50,000 crores to about 60,000 crores. That may help in some ways on the public health. But again, we don't know how it will go. Yeah, so, uh, so when you're talking about Jal Jeevan Mission, right, I uh, want to stress one thing here. So again, there has been an increase from 50,000 to 60,000 crores in the last one year. But if you compare it to the actual expenditure uh, for last to last year, right, this is like six times. So last to last year, the actual expenditure was somewhere around 11,000 crores. And uh, this year, the budgetary allocation is 60,000 crores. So I see that there is some form of a thrust to provide uh, drinking water facilities. Yeah. Uh, So that, I mean, if you look at all of that, maybe that will play a role. But overall, the picture is not looking good. Yeah. Thanks, Suman. Uh, so, Apoor, you wanted to uh, say something. Yes. So, just to add a couple of points to what uh, Suman has said. Uh, so, Sartak, in our nutrition sort of schemes, there is something called Supplementary Nutritional Program, SMP. So, this includes a delivery of hot meals, take-home rations to children, nutrition for adults and girls, so on and so forth, right? And it, this is one of the most critical element of the ICDS scheme, right? Now, let me talk about some numbers. So in 2021 and 22, at full coverage, an estimated rupees 42,000 crore was required to fund SNP, Supplementary Nutrition Program. And the total approved budgets was rupees 17,392 crore this time, which was just 41% of required cost. And the proportion that the approved budget was less than half what was required in 19 states and union territories. Now, why is this important? This is important because of another statistic which gets ignored in all our discussion on nutrition, right? So in NFHS, there is a data point that talks about the dietary intake by children from 6 to 23 months old, right? And if you look at that data, that's on page number five of the NFHS fact sheet, it says that states like Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Jharkhand, and Chhattisgarh, in fact, all the EAG states, the percentage of dietary intake of the children is in single digit, which is really alarming because these are the same states in which the prevalence of malnutrition, stunting, and underweight are also high, right? So hmm. you can sort of start sort of connecting the dots that the budgetary allocation is low. And uh, the, of course, you know, it gets reflected in, into the programs and the schemes. 
the dietary intake gets affected and so the prevalence of malnutrition. So in that sense, I think this is also a, a fact or a, or a data point that we should consider or that's something we should be concerned about. Yeah. Thanks, Apoor, for this. Uh, Pranay, you wanted to add something? Yeah. Again, a few points uh, in addition to what both Apoor and Suman mentioned. So I think the context is important. Generally, listeners of All Things Policy will know that Takshashila folks will actually be happy that subsidies have reduced in normal circumstances. Yeah. But the condition is uh, such that we know that there is a K-shaped recovery. Some people have been at the receiving end more than others because of this pandemic. And we don't know the exact poverty numbers, but I guess we'll know once there is a baseline number, which we know from NFHS 5, but the, the actual comparison can only be made uh, from the multi-poverty index, which will take one or two years. So we don't know how much poverty has increased, but we can estimate that, you know, there would definitely have been increase in poverty. After all, uh, after 40 years, this was the first time when we had negative growth rate, right? So given that context, it is important that some of these support mechanisms whether it is employment or food or midday meal schemes, those supports are maintained and probably even increased for, let's say, one or two years until the economy is back on track. So that's the context. And that's why we are talking about subsidies going down might not be the best thing on food, at least. The next thing also I wanted to highlight that only looking at the union government on health and education will give us an incomplete picture because these are finally implemented by the state governments. Education is a concurrently subject and public health is a state subject. So in fact, a lot of the expenditure execution will happen at the state government level. So it's important to also look at that. What are the state governments doing, etc. But I would also highlight that I would be okay if the union government actually even stops some of these programs as long as it increases funds directly transferred to the state governments so that state governments can then decide their own priorities. Like Apoorv mentioned, the problems of Jharkhand are very different from the problems of Karnataka on food, on nutrition, right? And it would be better if the union government actually gives a lot more transfers to the state government so that they can decide what are their health priorities, what are their education priorities. And But I don't think that has happened. So given that there is no significant increase to, uh, happening to the state governments in terms of the finance commission grants, etc. That's why we are forced to look at just the schemes that the union government runs, which we discussed earlier. Yeah, so again, since we are talking about uh, transfer to the states, I just wanted to point out that if you look at the revenue expenditure, right, uh, the transfer to the states, it has actually gone down. It has gone down as compared to the budgetary estimates for last year. It has gone down as compared to the revised estimates. But yes, there is some silver lining here. The capital expenditure, that has been raised. In fact, for the last year, there was a special assistance for of 10,000 for capital expenditure, 10,000 crores for capital expenditure to the states. It has been increased to 1 lakh. Uh, 1 lakh, so basically the union government is... Uh, promising that or it is the intention of the union government here is that over the next one year the states can take one lakh crore loans from the union government for capital expenditure so maybe this is something which is positive but for revenue expenditure there has been a decline right right yeah so yeah apur uh, you wanted to add something related to uh, law and justice yes Atak, i'm glad that you mentioned that because this is quite an under researched uh, kind of a uh, theme in budget and for the past uh, few months i've been interested in this theme and this topic so i thought that i should sort of highlight some of those points so i'm talking about law and justice budget and the analysis that i draw is from a brilliant platform and portal called budgets for justice now budgets for justice is a collaborative effort of justice hub and civis and uh, it curates budget data for law and justice sector. If you look at the platform at the portal, you'll see that they have explored budget data for institutions like courts, lower courts, prisons, police, judicial infrastructure, and police modernization, right? So I'll come to why this is important at a later stage, but let me first begin by talking about some of these sort of line items, right? So the union budget data for administration of justice, right? And this particular category includes expenditures on Supreme Courts, on high courts, special courts, judicial commissions, civil and session court, special tribunals, right? Family courts and computerization of district and subordinate courts, right? So in 2016-17, and this analysis is from 2016-17 to 2022 and 23, so it has actually gone down from 2016 and 17, the budget estimate 
was around 700 crores. In 2022-23, it's somewhere around 690 crores. It actually peaked sometime at two th- in 2018 and 19. So there's a bell curve in that uh, sort of allocation. Similarly, infra facilities for judiciary, extremely important when it comes to sort of assessing the capacity of a judicial system to deliver justice. In 2016 and 17, the budget for infrastructure facilities was just 600 crores, right? It has actually gone up. And in 2022 and 23, it is right now, it's around 860 crores. So infrastructure wise, we are doing quite well. Now, let's talk uh, about Apur, the... Apur, before yes. you go, again, my question on this is, hmm. isn't law and order and justice, some of these are, uh, law and order especially is a state subject, right? So, yes. are these numbers of the union government or of combined? Of the union numbers? government, Pranay. It's union right. government, Pranay. So, uh, how union governments are funding some of the programs and some of the schemes. So, these are all union government budgets and it doesn't include the state uh, uh, budgets. Again, the union budget for Department of Police, extremely important. It has gone up and this includes budget allocation to CRPF, SSP, NCRB, BSF and modernization of police. So this has gone up, right? So you see that infrastructure for judiciary and for Department of Police, it has gone up. But if you start sort of drilling down the data, you will see that some of the aspects within these data categories have done, have not been doing really great. So for example, modernization of police. Mortization of police, we have sort of started from 1600 crores. Right now, we are around 2700 crores. That's not a big sort of jump when it comes to uh, the law and order problem that some of the regions in our country that, you know, which we are facing. Now, why is all this important? All this is important because all this tells about the capacity of our institutions to deliver criminal justice. Now, when they are underfunded or their capacity to deliver justice is actually is also getting affected, right? And this is what gets reflected in the India Justice Report that I was talking about last week, that their capacity to deliver justice system has been abysmally low. And that's what is being reflected in our high courts, in the in our lower courts, in our tribunals and our police system and in prisons. So I think that's something that we should also start looking apart from welfare schemes and other, uh, you know, big ticket uh, schemes and policies. So Apoor, uh, when you are talking about uh, this law enforcement mechanisms and their capacity, right? What I would rather think of is maybe in different parts of India, there will be uh, different capacities. So some states might be doing well, some states might not be doing mm. well. Mm. So here I would, I, I mean, I think the union government's role should be to ensure that some minimum level of service everywhere. So those who are possibly, those region states which are possibly lagging behind, maybe greater support to them, but not necessarily overall increase in allocation, maybe bring them up to the same levels, some form of parity in that terms may be more helpful, I guess. Right, right, right. And we can talk about it in a more detailed manner sometime later, uh, Sartak. But yeah, you are right. So there is there are huge disparities when it compares to capacity to deliver criminal justice system. So southern states are doing far better than some of the northern states. So we have to draw that correlation that you've spoken about. So, but yeah, of course, there are, there are a lot of uh, disparities between those. Yeah. So uh, the next thing that we are going to discuss is the union budget's implication on defense, right? So what are some of the findings related to defense in the union budget? But before going into that, we'll have a small break. Hey, everybody, it's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On advertising is dead, Varun is in conversation with Vedant Lamba, sneakerhead and founder of the Main Street Marketplace. Vedant shares how his vlogging routine led to the creation of his sneaker company. On Shunya 1, Sheila Ditya and I are joined by Taran Chabra, founder of Neemans. We talked to him about how he started the shoe company and built a value-driven brand. On Big Talk About Tiny Humans, Devi Shobha and Meghna share a four-step guideline for talking to children about death. On Say No to Drama, Chetna drops some truth bombs about the happily ever after of life post the wedding. And on Hanswani, here's the story of Usbir Me Wo Kaun Tha. It details the tragic story of the laborers who had to migrate their villages on foot during the pandemic in 2020. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our others, for that matter, please do tell a friend. Don't forget to rate us on any other platforms that you're listening to us, whether it's a rating, whether it's a review, it all helps. And do remember to check us out on YouTube. We have a number of channels. They're available on ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, this week, Bank of Baroda, Coinswitch, Kuber, and HDFC Life Insurance. Thank you so much for making this possible. 
वेलकम बैक सो प्रणय यू हैव बीन स्टडिंग एनालाइजिंग द डिफेंस पार्ट ऑफ द यूनियन बजट सो इज देर एनीथिंग इंटरेस्टिंग इन दैट there is always something interesting in that i would say that uh, there's one difference between looking at defense and the two subjects that apurva and suman uh, spoke about right so as an analyst it is simpler in one way and very difficult in another so simpler in the sense that unlike the other two subjects uh, where both state and union government expenditures are to be taken into account defense is purely in the union list right in fact if you open the constitution first five items of the union list are all dealing with defense so that's the primary focus area of the union government right so yeah. if you can analyze the union government expenditure on this you have a good idea on what we are doing with respect to defending our borders externally now this was the good part the not so good part is that unlike other two subjects where there is a lot of scrutiny data availability you can look at how the scheme runs etc there is very little transparency in on the defense side right you can easily uh, a lot of failures can also be hidden a lot of things can be hidden in the name of national security so there is not much good quality data available on this side except two sources one is the budget and the second one is when parliamentary standing committee on defense raises pertinent questions right otherwise we don't have the great detail that we have for other kinds of areas right so that's the uh, not so good part of it with that as the background i think what we should look at on defense is i'll make broadly three points first point is that overall the trend in defense spending is not very encouraging and for that i am not going to look at just comparison from the last year's data because last year is was an anomaly in on many counts so if i am just doing a comparison with respect to the pre pandemic uh, time and how have we performed on that so if you look at that and again absolute number comparisons don't make any sense because nominal numbers uh, need to take inflation into account so if you just look at a percentage of a uh, union government expenditure how much was defense as a percentage of union government expenditure that gives you an indication of the priority that the government is allocating to a particular area so there itself we see that from uh, in 29 20 defense constituted around 16.8 uh, percentage of union government expenditure and that is down to 13.3% this year right so despite and you have to remember in between there is the whole china and hmm. ladakh standoff which has happened right so despite that what we see is that the union government's priority on defense spending has reduced so that is something worrying and we don't know why that is the case right if there was any reason why it should be increased it should have been now so that's the uh, big thing i won't go into the details of how much should defense be a percentage of gdp because GDP. no one really knows that you know it's a <laughs> number that uh, came up after 1991 kargil a standoff but uh, we don't have a good idea of what actually that expenditure should be the defense ministry actually needs a lot of economists to come to that number so anyways going ahead if the second part that i want to talk about is compositionally has there been a change and there are some good things in uh, the composition so forget the overall spending which i have already told has slightly declined but if you look at composition within the mod expenditure over the last Three four years, we had a worrying trend where the pension expenditure was actually more than the capital outlay, and that was quite worrying. But over the last two years, that has been brought under control. So now capital expenditures are again around twenty nine percent of the overall MOD expenditure, and pension expenditure is around twenty three percent. So that has gone down. But it, uh, I would also remark that it is just probably. a uh, partial relief because revision is going to happen in an, another one or two years and once that happens again pension expenditure uh, might shoot up but for now we can say that capital outlays have improved and that trend where capital outlays were consistently declining as reversed what has been spent in capital outlays also something positive so mod has increased a lot of uh, expenditure on coast guard capital outlay on uh, border infrastructure so those were positive things and much required things so that's a good thing 
and also within if you look at the overall capital outlay the, we also divide in terms of army navy air force right and there also we see that the naval capital outlay has been consistently increasing over the years and it was for example in 20 FY16 it was around 27% overall and by now it is 35% of overall capex so significant increase in capex on the navy and that's a good thing because a lot of defense analysts have argued that to counter china's overtures in the mountains probably we have to build strength in the oceans and that's why building a stronger navy is important and i guess the government is moving towards that so that is what i would say is a positive thing and from a public finance view uh, sarthak there was one disappointing thing i don't know if a lot of times there are these there have been these calls that defense should have these non lapsable funds for modernization because what happens is every expenditure that defense incurs for buying something from outside those expenditure happen year after year right it, you can't pay for rafale in one single year so you pay over multiple years but the difficulty for this kind of purchases big ticket purchases was that if you don't have a fund where uh, this money is accumulated and you are not able to utilize it by the end of the financial year the money used to go back to the consolidated fund of india so defense folks used to always say that this is a problem so the government did uh, finance commission 15 finance commission did say that you should have this kind of fund they also said how should that be capitalized how can the ministry of defense itself start putting money into it the government also agreed to it in principle but in this year budget there was absolutely no mention of this so clearly that has not taken off yet and we don't know what has been done for that fund which was touted to be a big reform so this is something that we need to focus on that's all sarthak i hope there is something interesting there yeah yeah definitely lot of interesting things here and uh, since you mentioned about this right so something which should have been there it is not mentioned so this raises some questions right do we have any accountability mechanism or what kind of accountability mechanisms we have the finance minister makes a statement the speech is there then the budget is laid out but we don't have very good mechanisms to hold institutions accountable right and the example that you gave is from the defense but again similar kind of things are also observed in other sectors as well right for example last year uh, during the budget there was an announcement made that some 50000 crores rupees uh, will be allocated for research a national research foundation will be set up and uh, 50000 crores over the next 5 years will be allocated for research and last year also in the union budget this particular term right it was not there this particular allocation was not there and this year also it was not there so i don't know how how good accountability mechanisms we have wow so it was 50000 crores over for 5 years. years 5 years so 10000 crores is ha. a significant sum and there is no mention of that in the uh, relevant ministries yeah so that was there and uh, not just this i mean i came across multiple other findings maybe in absolute terms they might not be as huge mm -hmm. but if you if you look at the degrees right if you look, if you compare it with the previous estimates it, it's just a kind of astonishing for example the ministry of earth sciences i was just looking at the secretariat expenses the secretariat expenses according to the budgetary estimates for last year was 42 crores but if you look at the revised estimates it is 562 crores 13 times it has increased so i don't know how come the expense for the secretariat is increasing by 13 times hmm. similarly for department for agriculture research and education so the budget estimates for last year the revised estimates for last year and the budget estimates for the upcoming fiscal the number is exactly the same hmm. i mean two two uh, places after decimal it is exactly the same i don't know <laughs> how come is, is it a coincidence or it is the, the number is like this so in fact i would be really interested to know how they arrive at these projections the budget tells you okay for this particular ministry for this particular department for this particular scheme this is the allocation but on what grounds on what basis this calcul calculations have been arrived at if this is something which we can get an idea about right it might be better right sarthak and i think you have also written about it and dr govindra has been writing about it for many years about the need or a fiscal council kind of a mechanism or a congressional budget office in the us where they actually have an independent body to analyze whether the government promises in the budget sort of are carried through in terms of schemes or even if there is even money in the government coffers <laughs> 
to make those promises come true right and i think that is a missing institution a very important missing fiscal institution in india's democracy yeah so i mean this year again for capital expenditure right so uh, there is a thrust on that again the finance minister announced that 7.5 lakh crores will be used for capital expenditure in the upcoming year then there have been some analysts who have been questioning whether we even have the capacity to spend that much amount of money right so if you have an institution like fiscal council they can go ahead and evaluate do we have that much capacity to implement these schemes whatever announcements are there whether they're just announcements or whether there will be some outcomes that's yeah but i i guess uh, i have been analyzing budgets over the last 6 7 years but what i see is that now a lot of us are able to look at budgets and analyze and point to some of these things so i guess that is the positive way forward more pressure will be built on our governance mechanisms and hopefully we'll see better institutions coming up right imagine what this would have been 15 years back when very few people outside the government even cared about the budget or could understand it or the government just didn't even have this information online right i mean you would have to write a letter to the finance ministry to probably get those copies of the budget yeah definitely in fact there have been some improvements as well apart from putting all these things online if you now look at the budget it has it is now it's not just one statement multiple statements are there and again they are they also know that different types of people are looking at the website so summary of many of these things will be there you will have different illustrations and one positive development that i see is one major positive development is nowadays you will also find an output outcome framework right with the budget there is also a statement right if this particular scheme gets implemented over the next what is, one what year what is that uh, sarthak can you just give an yeah. example yeah so for example let's say uh, we have a scheme like uh, the swachh bharat abhiyan right so swachh bharat abhiyan the focus is on sanitation cleanliness reduction and open defecation now maybe the budgetary allocation for the scheme is let's say 30000 crores and previously the budgetary allocation last year the budgetary allocation was 20000 crores now what will happen with that much amount of budgetary allocation and how do you know that i mean if i'm spending 30000 crores you are just this whatever you are spending that is just an input but on the ground how will things change right we need to have an idea about that as well so nowadays i mean at least for the last few years what is happening is that along with the budget you also have an output outcome document it highlights for some of the major schemes for some of the departments for some of the ministries what is the expected output if this much amount of money is spent and output is something which is more quantitative in nature it is kind of uh, uh, physical out it is something which is easily measurable so for example if you are spending 30000 crores how many toilet facilities will be set up how many community sanitary complexes will be set up so this is the target for the upcoming year and what is the outcome outcome is mostly something which is qualitative in nature this is the long term objective that has to be met so the outcome can be all the villages in india should be open defecation free or 60% of the villages should be open defecation free that can be an outcome so all these details are also highlighted along with the budget so in fact i haven't got the time to analyze all these output outcomes for this particular year i would i would just ask our audience to go through some of these things and check whether all these output outcomes are actually realistic and one of the lacuna that we have right now is the government says okay this is the output this is the outcome for this particular ministry department scheme but we don't have any independent mechanism which can go and audit whether whatever was claimed last year in the output outcome framework whether that has been achieved or not right right so thank you all thanks for this uh, nerdy conversation on uh, budgets apur you had something to mention yes, uh, so yes uh, pranay so uh, i think last year when the budget came i started a very nerdy i would say project uh, this is a uh, sort of individual project in which i started analyzing the speeches of all the finance ministers from 1947 onwards right and i just want to conclude by what our first finance minister uh, shanukam chetty said in his 1947 and 48 budget because now this is 1947 and he's talking about the leadership and stewardship of the leaders so just one paragraph which i thought was really very interesting so he's talking about the about the leadership and nation building and he said this that this can be achieved only by the rigorous establishment of the rule of law which is the only durable foundation on which the fabric of any democratic state can be raised respect for law is essentially a matter of political training and tradition and transition from a dependent to an independent status always makes it difficult in the initial stages to secure that unflinching obedience to the rule of law 
if the fabric of the state is not built on durable foundations, it will be futile to try and fill it with material and moral contents of a good life. I think uh, it's as it's still quite relevant in 2022. So I thought wow. that I should. Yeah. Close. What a nice way to end this. I think it's we should all introspect on what has been said and the Absolutely. fact that the rule of law is and what you mentioned about law and order justice are still a big lacune in our governance and we can fill it with we have been filling it with a lot of other moral packaging or other packaging but ultimately unless we get the basic structure of why the state exists right uh, then all the other things would follow from there so on that note and those wise words, we will end this episode. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Arthur. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in Inflation, fiscal deficit, GDP, MSP, NPA, equity market, wagera wagera. दोस्तों हमने सारे शब्द टीवी या अखबार में जरूर देखे होंगे या फिर सुने होंगे पर हम में से कितने लोग हैं जो ये जानते हैं कि इन सब का सीधा प्रभाव पड़ता है हमारी सैलरी पर हमारे इंक्रीमेंट पर और कम वक्त हमारे खर्चों पर दोस्तों मेरा नाम है अभिनव त्रिवेदी और मैं बात कर रहा हूँ इक्का दुक्का इकोनॉमी पॉडकास्ट ऐसी जहाँ पे इस तरह के इकोनॉमिक और फाइनेंशियल टर्म्स को मैं जोड़ूंगा सीधा आपकी जेब से हर मंगलवार एक नया एपिसोड सुने आई पॉडकास्ट की वेबसाइट ऐप या फिर किसी भी अन्य पॉडकास्ट प्लेटफॉर्म पर। वी नो यू लव फास्ट फूड फास्ट फैशन फास्ट पेमेंट लाइटनिंग फास्ट इंटरनेट स्पीड देन वाई नॉट फास्ट इंफॉर्मेशन On Think Fast, where we discuss the latest developments in the world of technology, business, marketing, pop culture. With a side of sarcasm and my dad jokes, not just mine. Not mine, Varun. My jokes are funny. So join me, guys, the funnier one, Suchita Salwan, co-founder of LBB, and me, Varun Dugirala, the co-founder of the Glitch. As we think fast, only on the IBM Network. Fresh episodes out every Monday on the IBM app, website, or wherever you get your podcast from.